Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is probably one of the craziest cases that I've ever looked into. The way it played out and the way that it was solved is just baffling and I cannot wait to hear everybody's thoughts on this one. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to NordVPN for partnering with me on today's video. Online privacy is such a huge deal for me, especially recently as I've been the victim of all of my accounts getting hacked. It was horrible, but with NordVPN, you can get online protection with a single click. NordVPN allows you to go about your internet browsing safely and privately with all of your data being protected by next level encryption. NordVPN never tracks what you do or share online and they offer a feature called Kill Switch to make sure that your online data is never exposed. One of the most common ways that people can be attacked online is with password attacks. Passwords are your first line of defense, but unfortunately, most people, including myself recently in the past, do not take it seriously enough, and boy, did I pay for that. I had used super simple passwords for literally all of my accounts, including my important ones because I can't remember different passwords to save my life, but that made it easy for a hacker to get a hold of my Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. They even got in there and changed my password, my phone number, and my recovery email, so I had to jump through all different types of hoops just to get my accounts back. But with NordVPN, you can turn on a dark web monitor, which gives you alerts about your credentials that appear on underground hacker websites. But even beyond data protection, NordVPN makes it so you never miss out on your favorite content. Even if you're traveling, you can set your location to home so it looks like you never left. Or if you're like me and you want to watch movies and shows from other countries, you can set your location to almost anywhere and gain access to that area's TV shows, streaming services, and movies, all using your VPN. NordVPN is the fastest VPN on the planet and it's super easy to use. I, for one, am technologically challenged, but even I can figure it out, so that's how you know it's pretty easy. But even beyond that, they have 24-7 customer support whenever you need it and a 30-day money-back guarantee for all users. And one account can protect up to six devices, which for me covers all of my devices and then some. So if you want to browse privately, protect your data, and gain access to content not available in your area, give NordVPN a try. Right now, when you use my link down below, you can get extra months added to your plan when you purchase a two-year plan so that you can stay safer for longer. This is a great deal, so again, make sure you go ahead and use my link down below and try out NordVPN for yourself. Thank you again so much to NordVPN for partnering with me on today's video. So with that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Zephanie Nurse. Zephanie Nurse was born on April 28th, 1997 at Groteshire Hospital in Cape Town, South Africa via cesarean section to parents Celeste and Mornay Nurse. Zephanie was the couple's first child and they were so excited to have their daughter. The two of them decorated the baby's nursery with the colors blue, yellow, and white. They built her crib. They had all the bottles, baby lotions, and powders all ready for the arrival of their newborn. However, the delivery was not an easy one. Celeste had to stay overnight in the hospital for a few days while recovering from her C-section. Of course, after having a baby and going through all of that stress, the nurses help take care of the baby for the time being while the mother is recovering. During this time, Celeste vaguely remembers that there was a nurse in her room with Celeste and her baby Zephanie tending to her. Zephanie had been crying at the time, so the nurse was holding the baby and comforting her before placing her into the cot besides her mother Celeste. And of course, after going through such an exhausting experience that childbirth is, Celeste fell asleep while the nurse was caring for her new baby. However, a half hour later, Celeste was woken up to another nurse in her room asking her where her baby was. She looked over at the cot where little Zephanie should have been, but she was gone, and so was that other nurse. Of course, immediately, Celeste and that other nurse realized that Zephanie had been abducted. Celeste remembered seeing that first nurse in her room wearing the same uniform as the other nurses, an oatmeal-colored top and maroon pants. 
but when she gave a description of this nurse to the other hospital staff, they realized that she wasn't even a real nurse who worked there. She was an imposter nurse who was most likely the one who kidnapped that newborn baby. After searching the hospital, police did find a couple of clues. Now, there had been a tunnel that provided direct access from the road to the hospital's main building, the psychiatric unit, and the maternity ward. This was intended to provide a shortcut for women in labor to be able to be transported directly to the labor ward, but it seemed that at this time, it was the exact way that the kidnapper took to escape with the baby. In that tunnel, police found a pillow lying on the ground. They believed that the woman must have used this pillow to fake her pregnancy because no one would have questioned a pregnant woman moving quickly through the tunnel to and from the maternity ward. When speaking with the other new mothers at the hospital around the days of the kidnapping, many other mothers reported seeing a nurse with the same description that Celeste gave. They said that this nurse showed up to different rooms, that she would speak to the different mothers, other mothers saying that she was very friendly when speaking with them. There was even another mother who had an interaction with this imposter nurse. She said that she saw the nurse holding her baby and the nurse said that the baby was crying and she needed to comfort her. But of course, she didn't end up taking this other woman's child. But because of these behaviors, it seemed to the police that this woman was at the hospital with the intention of taking a baby. It didn't matter which baby, just any baby that she could get her hands on. So when it came time to deliver the news to the new parents that their baby had been stolen, of course, Celeste and Mornay were infuriated. Mornay remembers that he went absolutely ballistic. He said, quote, I went ballistic. I even knocked over a medicine cabinet and all the bottles broke on the floor. He said that the one question swimming through his mind was how did she get in here? how she managed to get into that hospital and leave with a baby that wasn't even hers. Police looked up and down that hospital, trying to find any clues that they could, but there was nothing. The only thing they found was that pillow, but they couldn't find anything identifiable on the pillow. So, after going through days of labor, delivery, and recovery, and even more days of heartbreak, Celeste and Mornay went home empty-handed. They had no baby to place in that yellow and blue room that they had prepared for their little one's arrival. For the days that followed, Celeste said that she just held on to this hope that this was all some sort of sick joke, that her baby was going to be coming home soon. She said that even things as small as hearing cats meow would make her think that there was a baby crying. She was just devastated and she didn't know how to cope with this loss. In the initial stages of the investigation, it seems like there were some pretty strong leads. Police found a woman in the neighborhood that the nurses lived in who they didn't remember seeing pregnant, but they noticed she all of a sudden had a baby. So the nurses called the police and they followed up saying that the baby did seem to have a striking resemblance to Zephanie. But when police checked this out, the baby turned out to be a boy, so there was no way that it could have been her. After this, for quite some time, there was nothing, no new information. They started to lose hope. Years passed and they got no new leads and no news about their missing baby girl. The family tried to do whatever they could to keep the case in the public eye. For the 17 years that followed, they threw birthday parties in Zephanie's honor every year. They did numerous interviews with media outlets, and Celeste even started an effort to provide support for other new mothers who had their babies stolen. But then, 12 years after the abduction, by July 17, 2009, there was another lead in the case. The nurse family received a phone call from a woman who whispered, I know about your daughter. This gave the family hope that maybe someone was finally coming clean about what they knew about Zephanie's abduction. But the woman on the other end demanded $70,000 for information about her whereabouts. So, of course, Celeste and Mornay jumped on the chance and immediately got the money together, and at the same time, they contacted the police to tell them about this lead. The family put all of the money in a bag and dropped it off at the agreed-upon location, which was a KFC in Mitchell's Plain Town Center at 10 a.m. that same day. But no one came to pick the money up, 
and it turned out to be a dead end. Police traced the call back to a woman named Glenda Dowbell, a neighbor of Celeste's mother who had heard about the abduction on the news. She literally just made this up to get money out of the nurse family. In the end, Glenda ended up being charged and sentenced to three years of house arrest for this extortion. But even through all of the stress, even through all of the ups and downs, even through losing hope, they always knew that Zephanie was out there. They always had this feeling, this gut feeling that Zephanie was still alive. More years passed and Celeste and Mornay went on to have three additional children. They had a daughter named Cassidy and then two sons named Joshua and Michael. Cassidy would later come out to say that all throughout her childhood and growing up, Mornay and Celeste never forgot about Zephanie. They always pondered to Cassidy. What was she doing with her life? Was she safe? Was she loved? Was she being mistreated by the person who stole her? Cassidy also said that all throughout her life, she had seen stories about missing children who never came home, and she thought that that is what must have happened to her sister that she never got to meet. Cassidy grew up thinking that something horrible happened to her sister. Cassidy said that she definitely did not have an easy childhood. Normal things that other kids got to do, such as going outside and playing with the neighbors or going to friends' houses without her parents, all of those things she was never allowed to do because her parents were terrified of losing another child. Now, by the time Cassidy was in high school in 2014, she was approached by her English teacher who said that she looked just like another student. Cassidy was 14 at the time, but the teacher told Cassidy that this other student, a girl named Miche Solomon, who was 17 years old, she said that she looked just like her. Cassidy remembers one day after class when she was walking down the hall and she heard a student yell, look, it's the girls who look like each other. That is when Cassidy turned around and looked at Miche. They both said to each other, why does everyone think we look alike? Because at the time, neither of them saw it. When they met though, they both said that they just had this uneasy and nervous feeling after meeting. The day after the two girls first met, Miche approached Cassidy asking her if she wanted to hang out. Now again, Cassidy was only 14 years old at the time and Miche was 17. So Cassidy just thought that it was the coolest thing ever that an older girl was asking her to chill. So they ended up hanging out and from there, their friendship grew. The two ate lunch together every day. Misha would wait for Cassidy outside of the school gates every morning. Misha taught Cassidy how to do her makeup and would often do her hair in the bathroom before school. The two grew closer and closer as time grew, with Misha almost taking on a protector role. She told Cassidy that she would never let anybody hurt her or pick on her. Then, when Cassidy confided in Miche about her missing big sister, Miche said, I'll be your big sister for now. Miche was an only child who lived just three miles away from Cassidy and her family with her parents, Michael and Lavona Solomon. Now, one day the girls were talking and Cassidy asked Miche to see a picture of her parents. Cassidy describes that in that moment, she was stunned. Cassidy thought that Miche's parents looked nothing like her. Miche said, yeah, she gets that all the time. A lot of people told her that, that she just didn't look like her parents. Cassidy describes that she was honestly kind of baffled after seeing the picture. Their hair, noses, eyes, even their complexions were completely different. Cassidy said that that is the moment she realized that she needed to talk to her parents about this. Cassidy describes just having a weird feeling in her gut. She just had this feeling that something else was at play here. So she told Mornay about the girl who looked just like her, showing him a picture of the two of them, and at first, he didn't seem to take it seriously. So Cassidy planned on having her dad, Mornay, pick her up from school another day, where she brought Miche with her. The two met and Mornay asked Miche why he looked like her because at that point, he saw the resemblance. Miche said that she didn't think that they looked alike at all and after that, Miche left. After a year of being close friends, the two decided to ditch their school's sports day in order to get some food at a local McDonald's chain. Then, the girls met up with Mornay, who sat down with them at their table. 
At that point, Mornay asked Miche if he could see a picture of her parents. When he saw the picture, he said the same thing as Cassidy. He said that he just did not see the resemblance. He even joked with Miche that maybe she had been adopted. Then after this meeting another day, Mornay asked Cassidy to ask Miche if her birthday was April 28th, 1997. And she did ask her. And to her surprise, Miche said, yes, how did you know that? To Celeste and Mornay, that is all they needed to know. Now, what Cassidy didn't know was that Mornay was suspicious. He was very suspicious. He even called the police to ask them to look into this because he really thought that Miche looked just like him. Mornay would later go on to describe the moment that he sat down with Cassidy and Miche at lunch, saying that he had to contain his excitement. He really just had a feeling about Miche after seeing her, but he couldn't let on to Cassidy or her that there may be something deeper going on. But this moment for him, he saw how beautiful Miche was. He said that he just knew in his heart that this was his daughter. So the police followed up with Michael and Lavona Solomon to see if it was possible that maybe Miche was not their biological daughter. Police asked them for proof of Miche's birth certificate, but they actually did not have one. They also could not provide any other evidence that they were her biological parents. So they were instructed to take a DNA test to prove their relation. Now, when Miche was asked to take this DNA test, she was actually baffled. She thought that there was no way that she wasn't related to her parents. She told investigators that she actually was not born at Grootshire Hospital, that she was born at Retreat Hospital 20 minutes away. That is what her birth certificate said, so there's no way that she could have actually been born to different parents. But she was told that there was no record of her being born there. So Miche thought that maybe there was just some terrible mistake. She said, quote, I had so much belief in the mother who raised me. She would never lie to me, especially about who I am and where I came from. So my mind was made up that the DNA test was going to be negative. But that isn't what happened at all. The DNA test came back that next day, and that is when it was discovered that 17-year-old Miche Solomon was actually Zephanie Nurse, the missing baby who had been abducted 17 years prior. DNA proved that Celeste and Mornay were actually Miche's biological parents. Immediately after this test came back, Miche, or Zephanie, was moved from the Solomon home and placed with social services. Here, Celeste, Mornay, and Miche could all adjust to these significant changes and figure out what they were going to do, because of course, Celeste and Mornay were absolutely ecstatic and enamored that they finally found their daughter after all these years, but Miche was confused. She had no idea what to think. So, doing this gave them all time to get to know each other without, like, moving her into their home immediately and having all these huge changes. From Cassidy's perspective, like I said, she had no idea that Mornay had gotten the police involved. She had no idea that the DNA test came back and said that they were biological sisters. And she had no idea that Miche had been moved from her home. Until one day, Cassidy got a call on her home phone. She answered it, and it was Miche. And Cassidy said, how did you get this number? Since the two had only previously communicated via their cell phones. Miche said that she wanted to tell her something. She said, daddy gave me your number. I'm your missing sister. She told her about the DNA test that she took and how it was a match. Cassidy describes that in that moment, she was elated. She couldn't even explain how she really felt just that she was happy that she was alive and that Zephanie wasn't dead, that she was happy and healthy. Cassie immediately dropped the phone and jumped around the house. She was overwhelmed with feelings of warmth, happiness, and love. At first, Cassidy wasn't allowed to speak with Zephanie because she was at the social services home, but a few weeks after finding out this news, the girls were allowed to have a sleepover at the nurse's home. At the time, Cassidy said her parents were divorced, but that sleepover gave Cassidy, Celeste, and Zephanie 
the chance to talk all night and get to know each other. Cassidy and Zephanie already had such a close bond, but admittedly, Zephanie just did not feel the same connection with her biological parents. Obviously, this was such a life-changing, devastating thing to find out. She said that she grew up in a loving, stable home. She never once suspected that she was not biologically related to the Solomons. She was even more devastated when she found out that her mother, the woman who raised her, had been arrested for this. She still had an attachment to the family who raised her and she didn't want a new family. She wanted to stay with her father, not at the social services house, not with her, you know, biological parents because Michael was her dad. Zephanie or Miche went on to say, quote, I just felt this bad guilty feeling, but I made that decision to live with her dad because it was what I needed and where my stability lies when my entire life was rearranged which is absolutely understandable. It is probably so very confusing and painful to find out that the parents who loved her and raised her her entire life just were not biologically related to her. So upon further investigation, police found out that all those years prior, Lavona and Michael had been struggling to get pregnant until 1997 when Lavona finally found herself pregnant. But even after this time of getting pregnant, she suffered a miscarriage. I saw in some sources that this wasn't her first time miscarrying, that this seemed to be an ongoing devastating problem for Lavona. But this time, rather than admitting to Michael what happened, she faked her pregnancy for four months up until the day she kidnapped Zephanie. It was thought that Michael had no idea that Zephanie had been stolen. He truly thought that Lavona had given birth at the hospital because, you know, she was pregnant. She left the house, went to the hospital, returned home with a baby. So there really isn't any reason to question anything at that point. Now, there was a woman named Shireen Piet who was a witness on the day that Stephanie had been stolen all the way back in 1997. She was actually able to identify Lavona in a photo lineup as the woman dressed as a nurse who was cradling Stephanie before leaving the hospital with her. So, Lavona went to trial for charges of kidnapping and fraud. At her trial, Lavona denied any wrongdoing. She told the courts that after numerous failed attempts to conceive, she had been offered a baby by a woman named Sylvia, who was working with Lavona to give her fertility treatments. She said that Sylvia brought her this baby that she thought belonged to a young girl who wasn't interested in keeping the baby, and she thought that the baby was up for adoption. But investigators could find absolutely no proof of this other woman. And again, Lavona was identified in the photo lineup as the imposter nurse who took Zephanie. So with this and all of the other information that I went over, by August of 2016, Lavona was found guilty of all charges. And for this, she was sentenced to 10 years in prison. But even after all of this, Zephanie decided to stay with her given name, Miche. So that's what I'm gonna call her for the rest of the video. She really struggled at first to get close with her biological family. Even the relationship that she had with Cassidy took a pause while she was taking the time to grieve and figure out what was going on. Her and Cassidy did eventually start getting close again, but she wasn't really able to create a meaningful relationship with her biological parents at the time. It came out that at one point, she even cut off contact with them. Of course, this devastated the nurses who just wanted to reconnect with their stolen daughter. But of course, it was hard for Miche too. She was horrified at how people were treating the woman who raised her, and she just did not think that she had anything in common with her biological parents. She said that she has forgiven the woman who kidnapped her and is even waiting for the day that she gets out of prison. She said that Lavona is the woman who she will always see as her mother. She is frustrated that Lavona continues to deny taking her to this day, but she said that she doesn't hold any grudges. She knows deep down that Lavona did steal her and that everything that came out about it is true, but she said that it isn't helpful for her to hate the woman who raised her. For me, it still feels like I'm living a dream. Somebody needs to pinch me so I can wake up. So it's still a lot to process for me and it's, it hurts. 
you know, for 17 years, this woman took Stephanie away from us. And that's basically the foundation where a mother and a child forms a bond. And to meet her after 17 years, you know, it's, it hurts you. It takes a lot away. You're standing by your story that somebody gave you the baby. You didn't, you said you didn't kidnap her. Yes, I didn't kidnap her. Um, they must not judge me. Mr. in the Bible said, and Mr. Nurse know the Bible. He must not judge people, condemn people. And I asked Mr. Nurse not to judge me. That was in the past. It's now the future. I did ask forgiveness yesterday for the nurses because I never knew she was stolen. And again, I will ask him again forgiveness for what they went through. You know, even today, I sat there, I don't know what I was thinking, but everything shattered. Something inside of me, something blank, like pitch black, darkness. Shock. Yeah, yes. Something, I couldn't, I couldn't move, I couldn't say anything. And it was for, it was for, like, for a few seconds, I just sat there and Masha Nett started crying and she's calling her husband. And I was sitting there and I asked them. But somehow I was able to bring myself to reality and I asked them what's gonna happen now, what's next? Mm -hmm. And I was just sitting, but, and, and I tell myself, you need to, you need to put up a brave face here yeah, because, you know, you, I, I can't let, I can't let myself go right now because I needed, I actually needed my family that time. And I asked immediately, what, what has happened to my mommy? Where's my mommy? And they said, no, she got arrested. And I was like, it was like, oh my word, she got arrested. And, and I felt, I felt like I wanted to cry at that time. Like, I felt like I actually wanted to run away. And because I felt I needed my family at that time. And it's like, now I can't see my family. I'm kept here and still in Bosch. I'm so angry. I'm, I'm angry at everything. I'm angry at everyone. And, you know, I just want to go home. And I, and I want my life back. I want, I want Michelle back. I want my high school friends. I want everything back. This is madness. And this is a lesson more than a story. What if I didn't want to be found? What if I didn't need saving? What if I was perfectly fine living in a lie? I was perfectly fine. And, you know, all these thoughts were running through my mind and all of a sudden they asked, you know, do you want to meet your biological family? And I don't know what happened. I don't know how I managed to stay sane. And I said, you know, okay, I'll meet them. Because then I started feeling guilty. Like, you know, my mommy did this. My mommy, my mommy hurt them so much. And they took away so, so, so much time. I mean, when you keep your little baby, you create all these dreams. They're going to be like this. Their personality is going to be like that. And, and you create all, and, and it was just ripped away from them, like, poof, gone. By 2019, when Miche was 22 years old, she published a book with the writer Joanne Jowell, which documented her account of this whole case and what it was like discovering the truth about her identity. The book is called Zephany, Two Mothers, One Daughter, An Astonishing True Story. In an interview, Miche said, quote, My parents are Lavona and Michael Solomon. They are my mom and dad. Going on to say, Celeste and Mornay Nurse are my biological parents. They are not my mom and dad. They are the second parties. She also wrote about the trial in her book. She said that people were booing Lavona and cursing at her. It absolutely broke Miche. She wrote, quote, This is the woman who was there for me every day, making lunch for me and my friends when we came home from school. And now here she is on television being called a criminal. She also talked about how she just isn't Zephanie. She is Miche, even referring to Zephanie in the third person in her book. She wrote in her book, quote, if I hear the name Zephanie, there is a part of me that recognizes it, that gives it a reaction, but it is not me. I accept that part of me is Zephanie, but it's a part. So yes, I'm Miche, but I'm not the girl I used to be. I miss that girl. She is not there anymore. Through Zephanie, she realized the truth of her life, and now she's figuring herself out. She is. I am. Two people in that way, and they're trying to share space. It gets confusing. Miche is a reminder of who she was. Zephanie is who she might have been. Miche even said that she doesn't accept Mornay as her father. 
Mornay and Celeste did end up getting back together in 2020 after five years of being divorced. But Miche said that she could never really connect with him over that time and she honestly didn't really feel that he put in much effort to get to know her. She said that he didn't even really connect with his own children and she felt that. She even went on to say that she wished her real parents were Michael and Lavona, who loved her her entire life. In her book, she wrote about her two mothers. She said about Lavona, quote, you're paying a price for the cost of loving me. I forgive you, mommy, and I can't help but love you more and more. And to Celeste, she wrote, we don't have the relationship that we should be having. We might never have the relationship we were entitled to have. Thank you for keeping Zephanie in your hearts, but maybe one day you can learn to love Miche too. As of 2020, Miche was the single mother to two young children. But then during the COVID-19 pandemics, she moved in with her biological parents and her younger siblings. This gave them all the opportunity to bond and it gave Celeste the chance to help Miche with her children and it helped create a relationship that Celeste and Mornay had longed for. Ever since moving in with the nurses, Miche said that they have been very close. She wrote, quote, It brought us very close. They would literally speak to me about things that I never knew, things they never spoke about, how they were looking for me. They were waiting for me. They were ready to have me. They changed their lives to have me. The more I got to know them, the more it kind of felt like home. By March of 2023, Miche got married to a man named Justin Sheldon. In their wedding, both Mornay and Michael walked her down the aisle. It was the wedding that she had dreamed of and she created memories that she will never forget. Miche is now 26 years old and lives with her husband and two children in South Africa. As of right now, Lavona does still remain in jail and as of July of 2022, Lavona was denied parole. It was decided that she still needed to undergo further treatment as a part of her rehabilitation plan. So that is where the case sits as of right now. It's nice to hear a case like this every once in a while that has a relatively happy ending. I'm happy that baby Zephanie was found safe and sound. I'm happy that she was raised in a safe, loving home. That is always the best possible case scenario in a situation like this. But obviously, Lavona changed Miche's entire life. The parents that she was supposed to have the right to be raised by were stolen of that chance. They were robbed of the opportunity to raise the daughter that they brought into the world. I can't even imagine the turmoil that Miche must have felt after finding all of this out. It completely changed everything that she thought she knew and flipped her entire world upside down. Reading the articles as it was happening was heartbreaking. So basically the way that I spelled it out for you after her finding out about her biological family was that at first she did not accept them. She cut them off. She wanted nothing to do with them. And, you know, Celeste and Mornay were coming out to the public talking about how devastated they were that it was like losing a child for the second time, that she was stolen again. But as time went on, it seemed that they were able to mend fences and finally get that bond that Celeste and Mornay had been longing for. But that entire timeline, all of the things that happened is absolutely understandable. This case is such a doozy and I cannot wait to hear what all of you guys think about this one in the comments but that is where I'm going to end today's video. And now I want to know what you guys think about this case down below. Do you think that Lavona should have been given such a harsh sentence or do you think it wasn't harsh enough? What do you think of Miche's biological parents' initial reaction? What do you think of her not wanting a relationship with them initially? What do you think you might have done in this same situation? Otherwise, let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!